Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're glad you're here. This is a surprise special edition of our ongoing family conversation. We had ended these last week, as you know, and we are releasing this one. It will be a shorter version of what we've been doing, only because the weekend and what the Lord did in our midst and is doing in our midst, we just felt like it was important to capture this moment, talk about it a bit, and include you in that conversation. And so we're we're glad that you're with us. This is a, what I believe to be a historic moment for our family. So we've been having this conversation. We've been fasting for 40 days. And so it just seems strange, at least to me, to fast for 40 days, to reach, to repent, to really be before the Lord, and then to have the the kind of moment of sweet kind of small breakthrough and not talk about it. And so I'm here with with Dana Candler and Isaac Bennett and Matt Candler, and we're here to talk a little bit about the weekend and a little bit about what the Lord said to us that that we believe is so significant. And so just to frame it out, we had um, a visitor come this past weekend and it was just a whole sequence of events that was quite unusual. The, you know, April 9th, the last day of our fast, corresponded by accident with the 115th anniversary of the Azusa Street Revival, April 9th. Um, it it uh, just so happened that at the same time, we're hosting a prophetic minister by the name of Chris Reed, who uh, was with us this weekend and met with our leadership team on Friday morning came with a word for our leadership team that mm-hmm. was very significant to us. And then as he shared that word, then proceeded to prophesy over me, my family, then over Dana and Matt, and then over Isaac and Morgan and their family with some very specific, very personal, and very nobody-knows-this-about-us prophetic words that, uh, that really ministered to our families. And I'll even throw in Daniel Lim there at the beginning, too. It's pretty significant. Yeah, he Same called out manner. something Daniel had been praying for, but that was really in light with the narrative we're going to share in a moment. Yeah. And then spent the entire weekend from that point forward moving in a level of prophetic ministry. I love what Dr. Chuck Mateer, who's part of the Jesus Movement, uh, Calvary Chapel, Vineyard, he called it one of the most powerful and profound expressions of Holy Spirit power he's ever seen in his entire life this wow. morning. Wow. I just love that. That that really blessed me. But but here's the big point, and this is where I want to get right to it and get most of the conversation around this point. The big conversation really is what he said to our leadership team before he prophesied over any of us. That's right. And and we believe, I believe in particular, that the prophetic ministry the rest of the weekend was to authenticate the message that he brought. So what's the message? We don't have time to tell the whole story right now. Um, there will be another time, and I'm sure Friday night, actually. I'm sure Friday night we're going to tell the story in a greater measure. And so for those of you that are, that catch this broadcast, make sure you tune in Friday night to our 6 o'clock service. We're going to tell this story uh, way more. And, of course, we'll be, as Mike says often, we'll be telling this often over the days ahead. But the short version of it is there's a prophetic promise that we've been waiting for for a number of years. Paul Cain, um, the Lord told his mother that, the, that she was going to receive from the Lord a significant prophetic word on her deathbed that she was to give to Paul. And so, you know, Paul, after getting that word, Paul waits for 40 years. His mom passes at 104 years old, um, waits for 40 years for that prophetic word, that moment, invites Mike to be a part of it. And in that room, as his mom, Anna Kane, passes away on April 18th, 1990, at 4.18, she passes away at 4.18 in the afternoon, and she pulls Paul in and whispers into his ear the prophetic word, it's Luke 4.18, that the promise of God is summarized by the inbreaking of Luke 4.18 into our generation. And so... What Paul didn't realize is that it was April 18th when she said it, and he didn't realize it was 4.18 in the afternoon when she said it. It wasn't until later 
that Mike realizes, wait, she gave you Luke 4.18 as she passed away? Yes. Her final words were the prophecy of Luke 4.18. He said, Paul, do you realize it's, it's 4.18 the day that she dies, and it's 4.18 in the afternoon the time that she dies? You can't predict the day and the time of your death. She didn't know that it, you know, it was going to be that when she gives 418. And so on 418, at 418, she prophesies 418 for this generation. Well, Chris Reed, the very first thing he says to us, he said, November 19, or November 19, or 2019, the Lord gives me a riddle. And the riddle is, when the prince shall pass, it shall be Luke 418 at last. And he goes, brethren, I submit this to you to consider last night the Prince of England passed away. That morning on 4-9, the Prince of England passes away. He'll be buried on 4-18 this Sunday. And, uh, and the Lord said to Chris Reed, tell them that when this happens, which the them is us, it will be 4-18 at last. And so... That's the big surprise for us. The big surprise is we've been talking about this storyline that's unfolding that our, our family conversation is centered around, that Revelation 3, Laodicean spirit, in a Psalm 2, Rage of the Nations context, that's driving us by grace towards a John 13 to 17, we call it the Trinitarian conversation, related to Isaiah 19 and the 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 salvation and provocation of Israel and restoration of Isaac and Ishmael, the brothers on a global stage in the midst of trouble and crisis. That's been kind of our storyline that we've been focused on these last 40 days and beyond. But the Lord's at the very last day of the the fast, the Lord goes, I want to add something to your storyline. We're going, oh, okay. He goes, I want to add Luke 418. I want that to be a part of your conversation. And so... That's our jumping on point. Isaac, just you were there. What are your thoughts? I want to begin to talk about Luke 4.18, entering into our conversation and what that means. What, that's the big question on everybody's mind. What does this mean? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of implications to Luke 4.18. We've mostly talked about it publicly over the years in terms of a great promise of healing that would come, that the Lord would supernaturally release. And there are many other healing promises that are here and other places across the nations. And what was striking me about so many of Chris's words, not just his prophetic words that he was giving, but the personal words to many of those in our spiritual family that we know and love and celebrate and enjoy, is that so many of his phrases, even in his preaching, were these loaded phrases that meant volumes of information to us. It's, it's similar to if you've been tracking with our story here locally in Kansas City, the prophetic history side, if you just say, oh yeah, that's Luke 4.18, that's not just a Bible reference. That's four stories, that's years of promises, that's, there's a lot behind that. And he kept saying these phrases that's and right. backstage or just in a little side meeting when I'd pass him, I'd say, Chris, do you have any idea what that means to us? Because he's rattling these things off left and right, and it was like he knew our story, but he didn't know our story. But his phrase that he kept saying over the weekend was, I don't know you at all, but God does. And I think that's true. Over this whole spiritual family, over this movement that the Lord is establishing, and so Luke 4.18 is connected to healing. It's connected to the proclamation of the gospel. It's connected to the release and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in power, things that we have been contending for, uh, for the body of Christ for many, many years. And so to hear that it began at last, that was his word. It happens on the day. I'm a little bit speechless as to the implications of that, honestly. Uh, that To me, that feels above my pay grade. You know, I'm going to swing at a bunch of pitches here in the next few weeks and trying to contextualize what's going on. Uh, but the implications of that are profound. You yeah. know, it's, it's profound in the passage itself. So. Yeah. I'll just highlight one point that strikes me from the, um, from the word that he gave and somebody, somebody mentioned it and it was, 
It was the 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 last part of it is. Wait, I just have to say the yeah. way that that Cbets poster is positioned behind you. <laughs> It looks like as you're talking, Mike is smiling so big at you and enjoying okay. everything he you're does. saying. He really does enjoy what I'm saying. It's I just, thought uh, you were laughing at his voice because you shouted so loud on Sunday, which we'll get to. Oh <laughs> we'll get to gosh. that part of the story. I donated my tonsils I think, on Sunday. I think Isaac just blessed us and moved it. But it looked like Mike was standing behind you with a big smile. It was I couldn't help it. That's so awesome. anyways, you were mid-sentence. Oh, I Please love forgive it. Me. No, no, no. No, it's that in this in this word, this riddle that Chris gave when he said Luke or he said 418 um, uh, uh, begins at last. That phrase at last. I don't know if it was you, Isaac, or someone else that Stuart. meant it was Stuart. It was that phrase at last. And it what what he had communicated, what Stuart me, uh, mentioned was how you could feel the heart of Jesus, this yearning, this desire to pour out his spirit. And what was what was gripping me when Stuart was sharing that was the connection and relationship to the fast that was ending that day. Meaning we were asking the Lord to touch us, to visit us, to give us eyes to see, to clothe our nakedness, to, um, uh, to help us to open the door of our hearts to greater abandonment to him so that he would open the door to his heart. And it felt like there was this, this, this phrase, at last, was an, was an expression of, I have wanted this more than you can realize. So that, that phrase, at last, connected to our fast and our yearning, I, I felt Jesus' response to that, again, in a way that, we we're going to be figuring out the implications it's an important, as it unfolds. It's an important thing when we begin to connect with the idea that Jesus wants to release his spirit and wants to fulfill promises to his people more than we do. Exactly. Yes. When you're, when you're praying and contending for something for decades, it's so easy to fall into the weariness of cynicism and the heaviness that just comes, despair, discouragement. I mean, Abraham and Sarah, their life is marked by this over and over and over again, just the despair and heaviness. Mm -hmm. And yet it's Jesus going at last. Yes. And, and the desire of the bridegroom, the desire of the king, the desire of the judge to release his purposes in the earth far surpasses the faith of at least broken people like me. Yeah, I, I feel the surprise of what's happened this weekend. You know, we've been talking a long time in the last weeks. And I, in the last few days, there's just been waves of tenderness. Um, I agree with Isaac. I don't have words. I don't know yet what the Lord's done and is doing. But I do see this journey and to just underline the fact that this is his desire. Um, he's been wanting to do something, but he had to bring us on a process and he's still bringing us the process of fasting, the process of mourning, mourning over the gap, seeing our, what we lack, saying, I agree with what you say. And it's more important to me what you say than my own opinions of myself, the indifference and, and even getting out of indifferent love towards one another and seeing one another and prophesying over one another. You know, we've been on this journey. But I feel, I keep thinking of that encounter that Mike had. You open the door to me, to my heart, and I will open the door of my glory. Yes. And I feel like oh, something's opening, <laughs> opened, opening right. Jesus. And it's because his, he had that desire all along, but he's been bringing us so that we were prepared and are becoming prepared to receive what he wants to give us. One point that I want to highlight, just for the record, in, in reviewing some of the things that Chris had said to our leadership team on Friday morning, is he said, we will look back on this date. You will hear in the days ahead from leaders and people in the body of Christ all over the earth the significance of this day and this weekend um, looking back. And that I just want to say that, that as much as this was relevant and important to us and our spiritual family here, he, by that statement, made it broader, said, we will look back. This is going to be a significant word in the body of Christ. Because he also said in the context, when he received this word in November of 2019, that he knew that this was a transition for the globe. That he knew that this was a transition for the globe. And so I just want to document that. Well, this is so precious and important to our local and abroad spiritual family. 
He said, this is, as we will see, we'll look back and we'll see how the Lord was sovereignly moving upon leaders in the body of Christ and they'll reference this day and this weekend and looking back in the days ahead. Yeah, one of the things that I'm convinced of is that the Lord is wanting to say something to us that we are prone to not believe. We tend to not believe personal promises, and the Lord's going, you struggle with unbelief related to your personal promises. I actually have a global promise I've made through covenant to the earth. Romans 8, Paul references that. There's a global promise I've made to all creation itself that you are actually, I mean, we don't even have the faith to believe that we're involved in that global promise. That's Romans 8 as well. Romans 8 is the promise to creation that God's going to do something to the human race that's going to transform the earth. I mean, if you want to say it like that. And uh, the thing that I, I find so interesting about the Lord in our unbelief, He does two things to help us. He does about 50 things, but I want to highlight two. He, number one, He says, hey, I'm going to send this messenger that doesn't know you to give you a significant encouragement on something I'm doing that you're connected to. I've spoken this to you in your past, your history. I'm going to take your past, bring it to the forefront so that it has your attention. Then once I have your attention, I'm going to prove to you that I said it and I'm going to get you to believe it. So he spends the weekend getting us to believe it. But at the end of the day, when you boil down what the Lord does and what the Lord did, he really just got us looking at a Bible verse that we weren't paying all that much attention to. That's right. And that's kind of our history. That's our story. the Lord does these spectacular things to get us reading and believing the Bible. I just think it's so, <laughs> our prophetic history is so that. I mean, just even the narrative we talked about, Revelation 3. That's right. We wouldn't at all be talking about Revelation 3 if the Lord didn't take a Baptist to heaven in 1979 and shout to him his message of, the, of de- deliverance from the Laodicean spirit in, in, just before the Lord returns. That gets our attention. Now, what are we doing? And I'm saying this to the ones that are going, what do we do now? What does this all mean? What it means is not, we don't have to, I love Isaac's point, Dana's point, we don't have to figure it all out. The Lord isn't telling us all the answers, he's pointing us to the Bible. And he's pointing us towards the parts of the Bible that we wouldn't read or think about or give time to apart from his help. So he points us to Revelation 3 and we spend six weeks on it and suddenly we, we know a lot about Revelation 3. We didn't know on February 28th. Think yeah, about right. how much more we know about it now. I know. And how much we've applied it to our life. I mean, how many of us have been looking at Luke 4? We No one would have guessed that Luke 4.18 was coming at the end of this fast, meaning the, pointing to that passage in the Bible, just right. highlighting what you're saying. The whole Bible matters, but in terms of what the Lord wants to emphasize to get us where we need to be to engage in his plan, there are parts of the Bible he wants to get us into at certain times that get certain things in our understanding and conversation. We, we've lived it now. We, we now know if we talk about Revelation 3 together and pray about it together and sing about it together, if we do that over six weeks, we will be different human beings. Our friendships will be different in just six weeks, mm-hmm. not even six years. That's right. And he knows if you now do that with Luke four eighteen, if you start, if it gets in your, it's, it's so in our conversation now. I know. And it, it, we're doing this special broadcast to get it in your conversation, because the more we've now discovered that the the secret sauce, if more people talk about Bible passages the Holy Spirit's emphasizing and lean into the available grace for that verse to come alive, within six weeks, our whole life will be different. <laughs> That's right. And then the Lord goes, good now. Look at Psalm 2. I've got more to say on that. That's kind of what you did, Isaac, at the beginning of the fast, when you brought everyone around how we, here we have these passages that reference these realities, you know, the the Psalm 2 rage of the nations in context of the Joel 2 outpouring. I mean, you were highlighting those very realities that Dave's talking about at the beginning of our fast. Yeah. Back to uh, this point Dana brought up about the door. Mm. If we open the door of our heart to him, he will open up the door of glory to us. What is striking me this morning is this idea of Jacob's ladder, the John 1 51 angels ascending and descending, because when it's, it's not just a door open so that we get to peek into the glory realm of God, revelation chapter four and see his throne. Things are going to come out of that door. We just opened, I want to say something bold. I might regret this later, 
but we're, I'm going to say it anyway. We just opened up a door to the spirit that we can't yet understand the implications of the things that are going to go into that door and the things that are going to come out of that door. When my expectation of this Laodicean fast, 40 days, all right, let's get free from the Laodicean spirit. Let's get a spirit of revelation moving in our community, some dreams, some visions, and a couple healings. And yet the Lord goes, well, there's more than that. Once the door is open, we don't see it closing again right. in the book of Revelation, which is really intense until Jesus exits that door onto the stage of history in, in a visible way. I am, I am pretty disturbed. I'm pretty shaken by the implications of this. What's going to come out? What's going to go in? Encounters, what that means for our children what that means for the body of Christ in our city. When the realm of the spirit opens up and that sevenfold spirit of God that anoints Christ in this Luke 418 passage is poured out upon the body of Christ, buckle your seatbelts because in the passage, it immediately began to lead to trouble. That's right. When he says it, it leads to trouble. It begins that, so to speak, trajectory and that hour where he would go to the place of suffering and glory at the cross. And Matt, you were saying a couple of things on that the other day. Yeah. I mean, just when you look at Luke chapter four and you see what unfolds in the initial response after Jesus reads this in the synagogue, you see that there ended up that, that rage that we were talking about, the rage that's in the nations. And even for those that were intended to be recipients of the uh, the spirit of the Lord being poured out upon Jesus, where the story goes in Luke four is that they wanted to take him to the very cliff in Nazareth that overlooks where the battle of Armageddon will take place. And interestingly, even I, I knew this, but then I was reminded of it when Dean told me just a few days ago that across that valley from Nazareth on the other side is where the Gideon 300 would have been as well, no which way. is important to our yeah. story as well. And I'm, I just went, that's of course it's the same valley and so it's just like ah, anyways i got all the head shakes but highlighting your point is that it's not just yes the spirit of the sovereign lord is upon us and only good things are happening it stirs up the things of the spirit and there is a counterattack, and um and that's what you find here um and uh what follows in luke 4. well i want to just keep kind of moving forward a little practically um because again folks are there's a shock wave that hit our family this weekend and the shock wave is what did the lord do and what does it mean that's where i want to kind of stay for a bit in our last little segment what did the lord do and what does it mean and again what it means i just think is gonna reverberate i just think there's i don't again i'm just gonna keep sticking to what you two said we can't, the, the layers of what it means are going to unfold over years, not weeks or days. You know, as years. I was just looking at Acts chapter two this morning when the spirits poured out at Pentecost and it identifies three groups. It says that they were amazed, that they were perplexed and that they were mocking. And wow. I'm going to touch on this a little bit this weekend uh, on Sunday, but when the spirit touches and moves in that way, like we saw with Chris, there are going to be those that are in awe of God, confused at God so good. and mocking what is happening. Really good. And that's already happening to a certain degree. The, all three of those categories are happening. And then they say, tell us what these things mean. I mean, exactly what you're saying right now, Dave, that that's their response in Acts chapter two. And then Peter goes into his sermon and I mean, it is, it is so interesting what is happening right now. Yeah, it, it's not going to be clear what it means for quite some time. One of the things that we need to learn as a spiritual family is to allow for and to create space with patience that gives the Lord room to speak slowly over time together in a way that helps us go forward in something and not just understand something. Yeah. The Lord wants us to go forward together, not just get it. Right. We want to get it and move on. The Lord goes, no, I'm not moving on actually ever from this point forward. I believe that something began on Friday, which, which I like uh, something that Isaac said 
Luke 4.18 didn't begin on Friday in one sense. Luke 4.18 began thousands of years ago. Jesus said, "It's for, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. And what Jesus means is, in my opinion, that I always want to be careful with that phrase. Let me tell you what Jesus means. <laughs> There's so many layers to that man. I speak on behalf of Jesus. Yeah, that's a terrifying statement. But but what the phrase means, at least, today the scripture is fulfilled, what, what, that impl- what that implies is, today I've been anointed by the Father in your sight to do something. Right. Today, I am affirming that I'm the servant. I'm That's why they wanted to stone him. I'm the one that's been chosen by the Father. I've been appointed and anointed to do something. And that something is more than, as you said, a few healings and a, and a few signs and wonders. I've been appointed and anointed to bring justice to the Gentiles. I've been appointed to bring justice to the nations. But justice doesn't look like rounding up the criminals and throwing them in prison, though there's a little bit of that. Justice, Isaiah 61 style, looks like I've been appointed to bring justice, and I'm the one that's going to bring justice by healing broken hearts. That's right. Whoa, that's justice? He goes, that's justice. I've been appointed to bring justice by bringing liberty to the oppressed. That's the one you like, but I'm also going to bring justice to the poor. I'm going to preach good news to the poor. That's justice. I'm going to proclaim the Jubilee year. That's justice. Like, whoa. I mean, there's layers to justice, and that's why he's been appointed to do it. And so when I hear it's Luke 18, Luke 4, 18 at last, what I hear is it begins. That which I've been anointed to do is going to begin in your generation today. We've been saying Jesus is committed to delivering the church from the Laodicean spirit. Okay, so if we contextualize it to what's been happening in our little world, it would it, part of the storyline would be that Jesus is telling us, I am committed to delivering you from the lukewarm spirit, the spirit of sloth. I am committed to delivering you out of not seeing one another, of cold, dead love, and I am anointed to do it. He is going to deliver his people from the Laodicean spirit. And it's like this exclamation point, and yet the beginning of the new chapter is unfolding right before our eyes. And I am I am just so struck by if the Lord goes out of his way like he did this weekend to convince us of something, it means that we're to persevere in it. It means that we're to respond as intercessors. It means we're get to get on our face. When the when the Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts, the people were in the temple daily after that. It wasn't like, oh, the promises are here. Let's all go home. We don't have to pray anymore. Actually, the prayer meetings ratchet up when the Spirit of prophecy is poured out. The prayer meetings ratchet up when the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord begins to move on our city and on our friends and on the body of Christ. It goes the opposite way. And so we don't know all the implications of it, but we do know that prophetic, unusual prophetic words and anointing are connected to persevering through trouble, persevering through difficulty, because when the Lord releases his power, there is a resistance from the enemy that comes, as you see played out in the book of Acts over and over again. We don't have to keep saying that, but I am am so expectant, and I'm looking at our prayer room. I'm looking at the prayer movement, not just the prayer room, but what it symbolizes, the body of Christ going, the Lord going, okay, I'm going to deliver you from the Laodicean spirit. Now it's time to get on our faces. We've got to believe. We've got to contend like never before because now the faith is higher. The Lord told you secrets that no one else could have known, that no person could have manipulated, and now we have to respond with a commensurate faith. And that faith, as typified in Luke 18, is manifest through day and night prayer and intercession. It's one of the key signs and manifestations of faith on the earth is day and night prayer. It's prevailing faith. Prevailing faith is the value that the Lord shouted years and years and years ago. Prevailing faith. And prevailing faith is, here, here's what it looks like. I'm going to deliver you from the Laodicean spirit. Here's what it looks like. I'm going to bring you into a Trinitarian conversation. I'm going to bring you into unprecedented love for one another. I'm going to heal your broken heart. I'm going to bind up your wounds. I'm going to bring liberty to captives. I'm going to make you into the kind of family that expresses the justice of God yeah. as reconciliation and peace are your portion. I'm going to do that. And there are significant parts of the family 
that are not connected yet. And Dana, you actually highlighted this last night. You actually connected the Laodicean spirit that the Lord wants to deliver us from towards him, but it also has an implication towards others. And that if we're lukewarm and indifferent and slothful towards the Lord, by natural implication that overflows in our relationships to others. Yeah. Just right. comment that, on that. Just that indifference. I mean, he's brought us to a place. He's by our agreement, there's a there's a partnership, but by our agreement, he's removed indifference from our hearts. And that part of that removing of indifference is I have I don't need you. I have need of nothing. The the idea of I don't need others in the body. And he's removing that and has removed that so that so that we know our need of one another. And Um, So he's bringing healing with that. This is a little different, but what's been striking me is in this international family of affection, when, when the Lord says, I will do this at last, I just think of that 418 and, and the story of Paul Cain that Dave shared a minute ago and the decades leading up. And I mean, even on the way here, I was listening to an old vineyard song, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is Upon Me. And I don't even, I mean, it's it's not my favorite, but I feel tender because I was awakened back in the day to the vineyard worship and and that long storyline and all of the ways that the Lord has moved within the body of Christ, moved within this family of affection from all over the globe. And something shifted that the Lord says that times and seasons have shifted at last. (laughs) And I just, I feel that. And, And the one another thing, he's turning us to see the beauty of one another's stories and you know those that have been in for 40 years and 20 years and we're he's binding us together right now it's beautiful well i want to advertise friday night our encounter god service we're going to talk about this more and to quote our dear friend mike bickle we're going to talk about this for years to come we are we're going to talk about this weekend for years to come but not just because you know, whatever. We're going to talk about it because, let me say it differently. Uh, again, I'm going to quote Isaac. I'm going to be bold. We're not going to, t- I think the season change is that we're not going to talk about it because we're still waiting for it to come. This is the day in which the Lord changes the conversation from what's coming to what's here and what's unfolding now. I want to ask Isaac to pray for us to bless our time, our conversation. It's been a joy, these family conversations. Again, we're, we're doing this uh, again, May 12th, the IHOPKC podcast. So, you know, Subscribe to that now as they begin. We'll do so many more of these. But, but again, this is a special broadcast to just begin the conversation, to, to say what the Lord's saying and get in the passages he's pointing at and talk about them together. So Isaac, pray for us. Yeah, I'm going to pray. Um, Isaiah 61, 1. I'm going to pray it over us. I'm going to pray it over everyone watching on this screen right now and those that are in the body of Christ. I'm going to pray for the church. So, Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus that you would pour out your spirit and that you would anoint your people in this hour in an unusual and a profound way. I ask for the anointing to see the Lord I ask that you would touch our eyes with that eye salve of Revelation 3, that you would open up a door, that you would release your glory, that you would call people into their destinies, that you would settle them. I ask for those that are on the fence, that are struggling with issues of identity and calling in their lives right now, I ask that you would settle the issue and that you would get them into a place of strength and purpose in you to walk out that which you've called them to with strength. And in what Dana was sharing, Lord, I ask that you would give us eyes to see one another and to call forth the gifting and the calling of one another, that you would break down division throughout the body of Christ, that you would break down division through the streams and denominations and races and black and white, and that you would destroy those barriers that keeps the river of God from flowing through your people. I ask you, Lord, for an unusual anointing 
to heal, to heal people's bodies, to heal people's hearts, those that have been wounded. Lord, I'm asking you that you would release the spirit of the sovereign Lord through your son who is presently active, Lord, to touch the hearts and minds of people in the body of Christ that are struggling, that are hurting, that are afflicted, that are cut off from one another in damaged relationships and release your healing power in people's bodies. We want to see cancer shrivel up and die. We want to see diabetes be rebuked. We want to see men and women get out of wheelchairs and blind eyes open and the deaf hear, Lord, release your anointing power. Luke 4.18 at last in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Love doing this with you guys. Thank you, Isaac. So appreciate you. So appreciate that. Thanks, bro. Appreciate you guys. Insights, the candlers, you're the best. We'll see you again soon. Bless you all.